I want to thank you for that worship. <laughs> I'll give him a minute. <clears throat> I know I have a little bit of a problem with my voice today, <clears throat> but I couldn't help but sing on those songs, and I shouldn't have. Uh, but worship is important to us. It brings us into the presence of the Lord. It brings our heart where it needs to be. And in that last, last song we sang, there was a point where it talks about dancing. It says, I, I know it's foolish, I know, but when the world sees the light, they're going to dance. I can't help but wonder somewhat from this, what happened this last week if the world's not starting to see the light. And that's a controversial, and I'm not going to talk about it. But um, it's good that kids are not being killed before they're born. We have many things that we deal with in our world today. Um, I was telling some people as I <clears throat> came up from St. Helens that um, um, I have allergies, and I've been having problems with that, and I drove on, up to Cornelius Pass right behind a hay truck. And so, and so we're dealing with it today. But uh, God is good all the time. And he always takes care of us. He always provides for us. I want to begin with just a word of prayer as we ask the Lord to help focus our minds and our hearts on what he would say to us. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would open our ears that we might hear Give us clarity of thought and mind, because we want to hear you. We want to hear what your word says. And we pray, O oh Lord, that it will be beneficial to us and to your people. In Jesus' name, amen. From Psalm 68.5, it says, God is a father to the fatherless. And then in Hebrews 11 Verse 1 and 2 say, Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. I couldn't help but marvel as you shared some of the stories from Scripture this morning, the stories that we learned when we were kids, that we heard perhaps in Sunday school or from our parents. I'm going to share some of those things too. We need to get back to those stories because they tell us where our faith comes from. They tell other people how they can have faith in God. Let me tell you about Guy Bryant. Guy Bryant worked in the New York City Child Welfare Department. And you can imagine, he saw an intense need for foster parents, and he decided he was going to do something about it. And so for more than a decade, he fostered over 50 children. Once, time, once caring for nine at a time. He said, and I quote, every time I turned around, there was a kid who needed a place to stay. He was on, if you need, have a place, space in your heart, in your home, you just do it. The foster children who've grown and established their lives still have keys to his home. And they often return on Sundays for lunch. Guy Bryant has shown the love of a parent to many. The Bible tells us that God pursues all who are forgotten or those who feel forgotten. Though some believers find themselves in difficult times, God promises to be with them. God is a father to the fatherless. He's always there, reaching out to us, and he would give us hope. And if there's ever a time when we need hope, it's today. That man, Guy Bryant, gave hope, faith, and love to those who were fatherless. In like fashion, God is a father to those who have felt lost and alone. And God desires to give them hope. In a world like the one in which we live today, we all need hope. And we need to share it with our families and our friends. Now, I know in the back of my mind, you're thinking, how can we have hope in our world today? 
We can have hope by going back to those stories we first heard in Sunday school and from our parents. Stories like Noah, Daniel in the lion's den, Abraham and others. Why? Because hope has a strong connection to faith, to faith in God. And I want to repeat that because we need to have that ingrained within us. Hope has a strong connection to faith, to faith in God. Now, a simple definition of faith is trusting something that you cannot prove. People in our world today have a hard time understanding faith. Michael Todd has written a book called Crazy Faith. He says, today people Google everything and tend to believe only things they can prove without a doubt. Have you ever used Google? I have. I've <clears throat> checked on Google many times. How do I put this part on my truck? Google's something we use. But this makes having faith a challenge to people. So actually witnessing people acting on faith is rare. He goes on to define crazy faith as having thoughts and actions that lack reason, but trusting fully in what you cannot explicitly prove. Let's look at an example. In Genesis chapter 6, I want us to look a little bit at the account of Noah. This is the account of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked with God. Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of violence. <laughs> Does that sound like today? God saw how corrupt the earth had become, for all the people on earth had corrupted their ways. So God said to Noah, I'm going to put an end to all the people, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. I am surely going to destroy both them and the earth. So make yourself an ark of cypress wood. Make room inside it and coat it with pitch inside and out. This is how, or how you are to build it. And he tells them it's going to be 450 feet long. It's going to be 75 feet wide and 50 feet high. And he said, make room in the ark for animals. And you know that part of that story. But part of the thing that we don't really understand is what Noah went through. Think about it for a moment. He spent a ridiculous amount of time cutting trees and building this enormous boat that sat on dry land in the middle of a town where everyone could see it. Can you imagine the ridicule that Noah faced? You see, he, he heard from the Lord that a flood was coming, but the people of that time had, hadn't even seen it rain. Everybody thought Noah was crazy. That is, until it started raining. But when it started raining, Noah's crazy faith wasn't crazy anymore. It was only crazy until it started raining. Again, we ask ourselves, how can we encourage people to have hope in a world like ours today? In our passage of Scripture in Hebrews, I want us to look a little bit more at what the Word says. Now, faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not say. And he quotes some of the ancient men or heroes of the faith. Men like Abel offered God a better sacrifice. By faith, Noah, been warned about things not seen, built an ark. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place that he would later receive as an inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he didn't know where he was going. And by faith he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. By faith 
Abraham, even though he was past age and Sarah herself was barren, was unable to become father because he considered him faithful who had made the promise. And so from this one man, and he as good as dead, came descendants numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sands on the seashore. My friends, we need to read again these accounts in Scripture. Oh, I know. People have a hard time believing these accounts in the world today. We need to take it a step further. We need to share our own stories. We need to share our own answers to prayer. So let me tell you a story today. This is true in every detail, and I'm not telling you everything, but I'm telling you exactly how God worked. This is a story that happened right in front of our eyes in, at the church in St. Helens. It's the story of twins. Jason and Heidi discovered that they were expecting a child, and then not one, but two. A boy named Connor and a girl that they named Hannah. Heidi, the mother, went in for an ultrasound, and the doctor had earth-shattering news. The boy, Connor, had spina bifida. And the doctors didn't know if he would be able to walk, if he'd be able to have normal bodily functions, if he'd be able to be intelligent or, or be in a wheelchair all his life. They just didn't know. There was no way to tell how serious it was, but they were ready to operate him on him as soon as he was born. So they told the church family. And the church family began to pray. We prayed for healthy babies. We prayed for healing, and we prayed for month after month all through that pregnancy. And then Heidi went in to be induced, and they were on the way to the hospital. Now, on the way, and I, I, I've never had a baby, and you ladies know what this is like. I don't. But I do know that, that Connor was in the birth canal. And they, he was ready to be born. And on the way to the hospital, Connor changed positions. He suddenly moved out of the uh, birth canal. And so when they got to the hospital, the doctors took one look and said, you're going to have a C-section. At birth, they discovered that Connor had a fluid of water on his head and that he would ex have experienced severe trauma in a natural birth. But God had caused him to move. And the spina bifida had moved from the top of his back, which is the very worst, to the very bottom. Instead of it all being open, there was a 50-cent sized piece that was open. But beyond that, even after they took him into surgery and closed that opening, his arms and legs and body worked perfectly as a normal, healthy little boy. And his sister, Hannah, is perfect. We need to tell stories like that. But what they didn't tell us for a while is that Heidi, the mom, almost died. We learned later that she had nine blood transfusions. God was still taking care of that family. Connor is a miracle. He's an answer to prayer. He is proof that we can believe in God. It may seem crazy to the world around us, but they need to hear our stories of faith and hope. What do you think people in the world would do with that account? They can't disprove it. They can't say, no, God doesn't do that. They've got an example right in front of them that's going to cause them to rethink what they believe or what they don't believe. They need to know what God has done for us. And I dare say probably all of us have some story, some time when God has worked in our lives and changed things through only his touch, through his miracle. I want to do, read one, one other passage of scripture for us today because we need to understand how storytelling works. In Mark, the fifth chapter, is kind of an odd 
presentation about um, about storytelling. It actually happens to be the story of the demon-possessed man. A man who, um, when the Lord came to him, this man lived in the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not, excuse me, not even with a chain. This man lived among the tombs, and he would cry out uh, day and night and cut himself with rocks, and no one was able to bind him or put him, keep him under control anymore. When Jesus came, he saw him and fell on his knees in front of him, and he said in a loud voice, What do you want with me, son Jesus, son of the Most High, swear to God that you won't torture me. For Jesus was saying, come out of this man, you evil spirit. Then Jesus asked him, what is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for there are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. A large herd of animals or pigs was feeding in a nearby hillside, and the demons begged Jesus to send them among the pigs, and he did, and they went and drowned themselves. And then when they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legions of demons sitting there dressed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people what had happened, happened to the demons possessed man and about the pigs as well. And then the people began to, re to plead with Jesus to leave the region. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed, begged to go with him. And Jesus did not let him, but said, go home to your family and tell them how much the Lord has done for you. He had to go home and tell his people how much the Lord has done for you. I'm afraid that we haven't done a very good job of telling our stories to the world. And I know it's not easy. We get rejected. People laugh at us. But we need to recognize that in the stories, there is a, a um, storytelling device that remains with people. We find it in our most enduring stories. In The Wizard of Oz, Dorothy says, there is no place like home. She says it several times. There is no place like home. From the likes of Star Wars to the Lion King, it's known as the hero's journey. In brief, an ordinary person is living an ordinary life when an extraordinary adventure is presented. The person leaves home going to a different world where tests and trials await, as well as mentors and villains. And if the person passes the tests and proves to be heroic, then the final stage is returning home with stories to tell. The last piece is crucial. The story of the demon-possessed man closely parallels the hero's journey. And as interesting than the last scene, the man begged Jesus to go with him. And yet Jesus told him, go home to your own people. It was important that he return home to the people who knew him best, and to tell them his amazing story. My friends, we too need to tell our stories. We need to share our answers to prayer. We need to share how our faith in God has given us hope even during these difficult times. And parents, fathers, mothers, we need to share our stories with our children. They know us and they love us. They need to understand how we can have faith even when the world in which we live in is so difficult. I'm convinced that it's sharing why we have faith that's been the part that we've failed in. We didn't tell our kids well enough or <clears throat> our family members because we ourselves, I don't want to say are embarrassed, but we can't fully explain what God did for us. 
All we know is the outcome. But that's all we have to share. We need to let people know. God did this for us. And I think sometimes we're a little bit embarrassed about telling our own stories. I know I am. I don't know if I would share this story with you here. But I, during the middle of the pandemic, I had some, some heart problems. At least that's what I thought. And um, I went in for an ultrasound, and, and the technician looked at my heart and said, uh, I can't really tell you what's going on, but the doctor will call you next week. And that was on Thursday, and that afternoon the doctor called me. They didn't wait until the next week. And the, my own physician, my own doctor said, uh, you've got a hole in your heart, and you've got... Um, what could cause you a stroke. You got a blockage. And so I, they set me up with a cardiologist. I had to call and make an appointment and, and it, it was three months out. I had to wait for three months. And so all that time I'm praying, Lord, <clears throat> I don't know what's going on. And asking him to, to heal. What do you do? How do you take care of that? Can God make a hole in your heart go away? I didn't think so. Well, finally, after three months, I got a call from the cardiologist, and, the, and they said, well, the doctor's, uh, uh, he's not having in-person calls because of the pandemic. He'll talk to you on the phone. That did not relieve me at all. <clears throat> I wanted to see the doctor. I wanted to hear, and I wanted him to show me where the problems were in my heart, because I had seen the ultrasound, too. <clears throat> so I, uh, I said, okay, I'll talk to the doctor. What else could I do? The doctor talked to me and he said, you know, I wish they wouldn't call this by this name, <clears throat> which says, you know, where you, th you have a, a place where you could have a stroke. And um, he said, no, it's, it's just uh, uh, some fatty tissue that's on the outside. It's not, not in the way you're, it, it's not going to cause you a stroke or anything. <clears throat> and he said, uh, and I said, what about the hole in my heart? And he says, well, all of us have a hole in our heart. When we're in, the, in our mother's womb, the way you get oxygen from the mother is through this channel, this, ho this opening. And he said, after, when you're a teenager, most of the people, it, uh, it heals over and it goes away. And he said, well, if, if, if you were going to have, uh, going to play football now, they would make you have heart surgery to prepare that before you could play football. <laughs> I played football in high school. <laughs> the Lord was taking care of me all along, you know, and, and he said, no, you don't, you, you don't have a hole in your heart. You just have the channel between where you and your mother. And in five minutes, all that I had worried about, all my questioning if God could remove this hole in my heart, he took care of me. He answered prayer. He was taking care of me all the way along. God is at work, and we need to be at work too. <clears throat> As we have prayer, before we have our closing a song. I want us to think about the stories that God has given to you. You know them better than any of us. You may not think you have a story. Let's ask God to show you how you can share what has happened in your life to those around you. Okay? Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word and the reminder that you give to us that the things that have happened in our lives are important and they need to be shared. Help us, Lord, to have the courage. Help us, Lord, to recognize what you would have us to share. But above all, Lord, help us to be willing. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.